The problems facing New Zealand's primary sector have been mounting at a rapid pace. So I think it's time for open hearts and open minds. Now my hari mai and welcome to Sarah's Country to our wonderful community of listeners and viewers from around the globe who are curious to care about the future of how our food and fashion is produced and the challenges it faces. I'm your host Sarah Perriam and the pleasure is all mine to have the uh, to show up live on your big screen TV. Uh, or through your earpods the next day, either on the treadmill or driving out the back of the farm on podcast. I had a bit of a check into the stats today uh, for a job that I was doing, um, and uh, there was a point there that I was absolutely blown away. Now, I have said this quite a few times on the show due to the comments and the emails that I do get that we do have a global audience, but last week... Uh, and just shy of 50% of Serious Country's listeners were from outside of New Zealand. Would you believe that? It just confirms to me that New Zealand produced media does always need to remember that we are broadcasting our messages not only to ourselves, but our global family, and we do need to watch our words. All of this talk of trade over the last couple of days here on the show makes me sort of feel like our wonderful country that produces some of the most ethical produced food and fashion in the world is like this kayak rocking out in the ocean with all of the vulnerabilities to the world around us. It is scary, but we absolutely have uh, a fantastic passion and uh, some fantastic uh, leaders within certain parts of our sector that are there to represent us. But it certainly is something that we do need to take into account. The world is watching and it is a free market. Uh, Now we do need to hold the hands of everyone that we can in 2021 for this challenge. I I seriously do hope that 2021, we take this buzzword of collaboration from a noun into a verb. I want to see brave and bold leadership from the ground up, not so necessarily looking up for the top to be uh, bringing that down. You know, pairing up with the an unlikely partner to bridge the gaps across our sectors could be something that can enhance and take us all forward in that Goliath called our global trade and support those already putting in the hard fight to excel rather than bringing in more working parties of outside people and committees around these issues. Let's make 2021 the Dewey to the Hui, the year of just getting on with it. Now, getting on with it is not something our fruit and vegetable growers can do this season as they have their hands tied without the valuable seasonal migrants harvesting the crops that will now be left to rot and the price of fruit and vegetables to skyrocket. Is this our little red hen moment? Who will help me harvest the crops? Not I, said the unemployed New Zealander. Who will help me afford fresh fruit and vegetables for my family, says the unemployed New Zealander. Not I, said the broke grower or orchardist. It is an absolute dire reality around this labour shortage and uh, I absolutely want to extend some much needed aroha love to our fruit growers tonight. We will be continuing to talk about this topic uh, of our labour shortage with some distinguished guests I'll tell you about very shortly but I thought it would be an opportunity to show that love in the comments below uh, talking about our favourite fruits. Our favourite fruit dessert is more specific, but if you'd like to share anything, I think that's just fruit desserts is something that, um, isn't that just the most incredible thing uh, to have that just tops it off? And uh, even if you're not a sweet tooth, I'm not much of a sweet tooth, but I can always go a good fruit dessert. Uh, I much like an apple rhubarb crumble in winter um, and and certainly love some kiwi fruit. I actually was getting some kiwi fruit the other day because I hadn't had some for, for quite some time. Uh, certain, you know, with your blueberries and your strawberries and all the wonderful things that are out in season at the moment for my uh, cereal in the morning. And I overheard this conversation with a woman and her son and the, the mother says to the son, now green or gold? And the son looks at her and goes... <laughs> 
gold <laughs> as in that has become such an awesome part uh, of our culture wherever you are tuning in to watch Serious Country Live if it's your first time in the comments below uh, it's a great way to join the conversation and have a bit of fun around the comments you can of course put in uh, some questions for our guests as well I'm celebrating that uh, my, my favourite should I say my favourite Irishman is back from a very long holiday travelling around this country and uh, he's happy to be back. Joel Rock, welcome back to Sarah's Country. <laughs> Coming on in there from a, a different background of a producer booth tonight. Hello. Hello. There'll be so many people that are happy to see you. For all our regulars, can you give a big th- um, wave and, uh, and uh, a shout out to Joel to welcome him back into the hot seat here at Sarah's Country. Joel, fruit desserts. What's the Irish tradition around fruit and desserts? Um... Well, I don't know where you all got the idea that pavlova is your thing, because back in <laughs> back in Northern Ireland, I mean, we're we're all keen on a, a good pavlova. Although you all put like kiwi fruit and stuff on it, and we're like oranges. I don't know, like yeah, orange halves. Well, that would be how I'd have a pavlova anyway, or my granny would make a pavlova. Did you see any great places that you might stop off and maybe not return home to um, the hot seat here at Sarah's Country that you might have been able to park up the camper van and uh, lend a hand to those very desperate fruit pickers. What what type of fruit do you think of all of the, the fruit that you've learnt that New Zealand grows you could lend a hand to? Uh, the easiest one to pick? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Apples kiwi- is not. Apples? No? Okay. <laughs> Maybe some kiwi for it. That seems like a pretty straightforward one. Yeah, Yeah, well, I certainly also berries getting down on the ground. It's quite back-breaking work, but certainly worth it. Especially you'd get busted, wouldn't you, having all the red around from eating them. (laughs) Uh, I'd love to hear from you wherever you are or watching or listening around the country. And the other thing too is uh, there's been a bit of moisture across, across the country. I'd love to hear if it is happening at your place. Certainly starting to roll in this afternoon here in Canterbury and I know up in the North Island is certainly persisting down so uh, we always like to celebrate rain here on Sarah's Country. Now after 7.20 Damien O'Connor Minister of Agriculture is pushing post-election for limits on forestry on certain classes of land it will require resource consent. We will also talk to him about the latest trade agreements uh, this is the RCEP that he was heavily involved with and celebrating the biosecurity awards where is his direction for this term. Uh, after 7.30, how can New Zealand farmers profit from the popularity of plant-based proteins globally? Susan Goodfellow, founding director of uh, Left Field Innovation, will share the opportunities of certain crops, in particular peas. And uh, to close the show on this theme, kiwi fruit industry is the kiwi fruit industry is also feeling the impact of the recognised seasonal employer labour shortages. Nikki Johnson, Chief Executive for New Zealand Kiwi Fruit Growers Incorporated, will show uh, share with us her concerns. But firstly, to kick us off, he is going to whip off the suit jacket and head into the orchard this summer. He is leading by example. There is no one else I have seen absolutely take the cherries into their hands and the ball by the horns uh, is Tim Cadogan, Mayor of Central Otago, who will share uh, this absolute concern that the fruit will fall to the ground and left to rot if not picked this season. An extremely valuable crop to the New Zealand economy and uh, Tim will be with us very shortly here on Sarah's Country. This is Sarah's Country. Delicious. Ever wondered where it starts? Does it start with care? Respect. Fresh grass, 365 days a year. The truth is, delicious doesn't start in a single moment or with a single ingredient. Delicious starts here. 
Every morning, Kiwi farmers wake up to produce higher quality food. Yet every night, some Kiwi families are going to sleep hungry. Meet the Need is a charity founded by farmers and it's here to change all that. We're about New Zealand farmers feeding New Zealand families by donating a small part of what we grow when we can. You can help us make sure no one in New Zealand goes to sleep hungry again. Visit meettheneed.org and follow us on social. Fantastic, Joel. You've got some uh, great comments coming in here from our regulars. John Williams says, Kia ora, Joel. And Michael Ross says, great to have you back, Joel. Uh, Jolanda is giving four big waves. You have been sorely missed, Joel. I just want to give uh, an extended thank you to the New Zealand Immigration for extending Joel's working holiday visa. He is here to stay for the near future. And we are very, very excited to have him back on the Serious Country team following a very long experience extended and lovely holiday um, and I don't believe he thinks he could be anywhere better in the world but I know that he would absolutely love to be home for Christmas um, but however uh, what a wonderful country to be back in. Now, as reported by journalist Neil Wallace in this week's Farmers Weekly, a significant amount of fruit will fall to the ground and be left to rot if not picked during harvest season. I did mention cherries, but Central Otago, my hometown of Cromwell, is home to a variety of incredible stone fruit. And the Mayor of the Central Otago District Council, Tim Cardogan, joins us now. Tim, this is getting to a very dire situation. It feels like like uh, banging on in the door of an empty room. Yeah, it does quite a bit, Sarah. I'm running out of ideas. I think everybody's on tender hooks. And the problem, there's a multitude of problems here, but one of the problems we have is we don't know exactly when the cherries are going to be ready. And, and you're quite right to talk about the other crops. Cherries are where we hit the peak of the people that are needed. But um, there's, there's really some desperate situations arriving even in the apple um, industry now. Uh, grapes looking further forward. It, it covers quite a long period of time. So for those not familiar, cherries really is that first sort of pre-Christmas right through until grapes in April. And around that January time, we have our beautiful, uh, bigger stone fruits like apricots, nectarines, etc. Now, Tim, you've said you've actually made a commitment to spend your Christmas holidays working in a cherry pack house. How serious are you about this? Oh, I'm, I'm deadly serious because at the moment there's no cavalry riding in. So if Central Otago wants to save itself and it's our economy first, followed by New Zealand second, we're going to have to do it ourselves. So I'm saying to my people in Central, hey, we need to get out there. We need to either work for ourselves. You might not need the money um, yourself or you might be on holiday and you want to have a break. But if you want that cafe that you like or that shop that you like to shop at to stay open, we've got to get this off. It's 20% of our economy. So um, no use talking about it. I've got to get myself out there and do it. Hey, um, so I'm thinking of the the likes of um, the families of, uh, you, you know, around Cromwell. Um, it's absolutely escaped me. Um, but, they, I mean, they, they, they suffered from the times and relocated when they lost their orchards through the dams. And, mm. and, and ha- how is, significant as this in terms of the challenges that they've had from climatic weather, trade, and all of those challenges along the way to today? It's a challenge. Yeah. I'm, I'm a guy whose career depends on the public mood every three years, and yet I say I wouldn't have the courage to be a farmer or a fruit grower or anything because it can go, there's so many different ways that you get attacked. And, and this is just another crisis that's facing these folk. And they've worked hard to try to find solutions. There's been some innovative solutions. We've tried job fairs in um, Queenstown, um, largely assisted by my brother, the mayor of uh, Clutha District, and some government funding he got alongside near Bolter, Queenstown. Um, we've had had one um, operation that has said uh, they've done a deal with a camper van company. So for accommodation, here's your camper van, um, really cheap rates. And when you're not working, you can take the camper van up and go swim in the lake or go go on a wine tour or whatever, or, you know, as long as you've got a sober driver. So every in thought's been put, put, put towards this and we're, we're getting pretty run out of ideas.
Yeah, absolutely. Um, Michael Ross has got a question. What skill sets are needed to help the picking? If the requirements are not difficult, let's go help locally. Um, it, it, it's not, I mean, it's not that physical, is it? Look, I haven't done it myself, but my understanding is um, if, you, if you're doing apples, um, an, an apple picker over a full season will climb 25 vertical kilometres up those ladders yeah. carrying a lot of weight. So that's that's very physical. But when it comes to the cherries, um, you, people like myself, as Stu Duncan, who I think is a regular viewer of your show, said at one of my council meetings today, if I go picking, only the, the low-hanging fruit will get picked. It's all of me. But, um, but for, for me, I'm in my mid 50s. I'm probably going to be more used in the pack house and let some young people or fitter people out um, up the ladders. I don't know. I'll do what the boss tells me. But, but there is a variety of work. We concentrate, I think, in our own minds if we're not in the industry on the picking. But there's a lot of ancillary work, um, even bird scaring, things like that. But um, the pack house takes a lot of people too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the Jacksons, my sincere apologies yes. for forgetting because I did work many summers for them, um, Mark and, and Kevin Jackson, and uh, I, I've done both, picking cherries, and i tell you what, in the pack house, um, I'm just going to warn you, and I want you to let me know if this happens to you, you will have yeah. dreams of cherries going across your eyes like this. I, I got myself through university by working in the shearing sheds, yeah. and I used to dream of sheep. It did my head and I couldn't get away from them. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and hey, look, how many people are paying for spray tans and gym memberships? You, what a great way to get that at the same time. I, I, I'd like, I can't do um, the cherry season, but I'd like to commit to um, coming down and also doing um, some apricots as well because it, it doesn't hurt. And uh, even if it's a couple of days, it makes a real, real difference. But what about some of these opportunities that I'm seeing online? I mean, there's a lot of untapped agricultural uh, um, opportunities Opportunities that people have said that overlooked in the past, the ex-prisoners is an example. Uh, and what sort of conversations are you having with MB to really understand this? Because, I mean, this is this is their fault and also a Ministry for Social Development. I think it's rough to say it's anybody's fault. What we've got is a situation where the taps of the Nivan workers who are just fantastic workers and such a great part of our community, there's nowhere near as many of them in the country as we would normally expect, and the overseas workers. So what's happened is with, that we've had a system that worked. It worked for everybody, and with COVID, with so many other industries as well, it's just hit like a hammer, and so we've suddenly got this problem. Um, MB is doing some good work Um Look, I would love to see um, a couple of four, five, ten plane loads of Nibans landing at Queenstown Airport um, at, at New Year's. It's almost certainly not going to happen. Um, but but it's, I'm not here to blame anybody. We've just got to find solutions. So what is the size of the hole, the damage, in terms of numbers required? Uh, numbers between four and 5,000 people. And, yeah, at the real peak. And that's... What you've got to keep in mind is my whole district is 22,000 people. So it's not like we've got a big city right next door where we can just grab people and, and move them in. But um, we, we don't know what's going to turn up. And that's part of the problem is that the cavalry could be just over the horizon. We've, we've done a lot of, when I say we, the industry has done a lot of advertising with the Motor Home um, Association of New Zealand because we've got the grey nomads cruising around and they're always eager to help and they've got their own accommodation and come in and make some, what they used to call it, pin money, you know. Um, we, we've just got to try to do absolutely everything we can. I've always said with this one, there's going to be a dozen solutions and we've got to pick up every single one of them. There's not going to be one band-aid that's going to fix the whole thing. The Queensland Job Expo was not just about horticulture. It was a broader uh, discussion mm. around it, as particularly in, in, in pairing up of skill sets has been a real big issue. I'd love to know the learnings that you got from that. Was it, a, was it an extreme disappointment or, or was there some silver linings out of it? When we did this, um, the, at the very start of the day, my brother Brian, who's the mayor of the Clutha district, said, if we get one person a job, then today will have been a success. You know, one person who's had their ass kicked through COVID or whatever reason, and we get them a job, then that's a win. Um, it's a very but, ex lot of government funding for one person to be yeah. employed, though. Well, and, we, and there were certainly greater achievements than that. But it was disappointing um, particularly the number of New Zealanders who turned up. And there may be a multitude of reasons for it. Um, it may be that they um, knew that, hey, once the time comes, I'm just going to climb in my car and drive down to Cromwell and I'll be sorted. There'll be a job there. I don't need to come to a jobs fair in October. I hope that's the case and that um, they will turn up. But also, 
even in the time period from when the job opportunities was planned to when it happened, the Queenstown economy showed far greater resilience than was expected. So the vast numbers of unemployed that were expected to happen, touch wood, haven't, haven't really happened yet. So that, that is the biggest metropolis in inland Otago. You can call it a metropolis, biggest um, labour pool. And it's still ticking over all right. So lessons learnt, um, we just keep trying. Yeah, yeah. Hey, um, I'm just going to sneak on a wee opportunist as I am uh, in no. here. Uh, most regional councils, uh, mayors and CEOs of regional councils are having a lot of fun with this uh, fresh water policy and implementation. How is the Central Otago uh, District Council working through the devil in the detail as it's being oh, described? And look, I think the aspirations are entirely correct. We're not going to have any arguments with that. We have um, a timeline which is is difficult and I think the biggest factor in all of this, I'm a townie, okay, I've lived in small town New Zealand all my life, but I've never been a farmer, but I've, I've been, you know, next door to, you know. Um, I've worked really hard at getting an understanding of what this means, essentially on one river, on the Manyahitakea. I've worked really hard in the four years I've been mayor of getting an understanding. If I had to sit an exam tomorrow, I'd, it'd probably be like my law degree, it'd be a C, maybe a C minus, you know, it's hard stuff to learn. And so the communication through to the towns, and I'll tell you a really big one, the Manyahitakea occasionally peaks off for E. coli, right? So when that happens, the townies go, oh, the bloody cow cocky's up the stream, you know? We keep saying to the ORC, and I say again here, when you get one of those things trigger off, do a DNA test on it, because I'm not entirely sure it's cows. It might be it might be our Omako um, sewage treatment plant. Don't know, because we, we're doing work on it. So there's a lot of blame game going on here. And um, in so much detail, and it's so hard to get across to the people in in the towns that that yeah, we, we need to do things right. Um, and most farmers that I talk to want to do things right, absolutely. But some of the directions that are being given are fairly one size fits all. I'm in Wellington, and God knows when you're in Wellington, you know Wellington knows best. Um, but it doesn't. One size doesn't fit all. You can't apply rules to Southland or the West Coast, goodness help us, that are going to work in central Otago because you've basically got a rainforest climate that's 150 kilometres away from a Mediterranean climate. How on earth are you going to make rules that, that fit for all? And on the flip side of what I would say is that there is still the odd um, rural person out there who thinks, no, bugger it, the good old days are the ways that they were and everything was all right and it'll be fine. Those attitudes have to be challenged and have to go as well. We've got to find a way through this together, but... As I say again, you know, I could be unemployed in just under two years. Um, that's the world that every mayor lives in. I still couldn't take the gambles and risks and fighting against the winds that the people of the country take. I haven't got the balls for it. So, so implementation of the policy is going well then, Tim, by the sounds of it. Um, no, thank you so much. I really appreciate your honesty. Uh, and I know a lot of our viewers and listeners will as well, um, because it, it is certainly something that we continue to follow here on Serious Country. Before you go, we mm -hmm. are going to celebrate fruit desserts tonight, though, because okay. what, what is your favourite? Ah, Right. This is really easy. I do the best baked apple in the world. And you can ask any member of my family, and half of them would say I do, and the other half would disagree. But I just love it. A big Granny Smith or something like that. You just take the, take the top bit of it, absolutely ram it full of goodness in the form of butter, brown sugar, and sultanas, and cloves, and cinnamon. Pack it in. Put far too much in so that when it sits in the, in the oven, that turns to toffee. And, ah, oh, look, it's just a bit of custard. Yeah, Ooh, it's about 5,000 calories a dose, but hey, you want to live forever. <laughs> that sounds amazing, and it got me thinking about one of my favourite is um, a, a Pinot Noir soaked poached pear with a wee side of blue cheese. Oh, mate. <laughs> now you're talking. Don't you live, I want to say we, but I'm not living there anymore, in the yeah. best food basket in New Zealand, Central Otago. Oh, absolutely we do. And yeah. that is the mere Tim Cardogan from Central Otago on the topic of the labour shortage uh, and the fruit this season potentially rotting on the ground. Your comments coming in. John says, apple and rhubarb crumble on the menu next time you're down. That's on John. 
Uh, we might get the Thai Tap Hotel to cook it for us, though. And uh, black currants in the past are in my dreams. Okay. All coming through. Neil Pugh, it's the bad ones letting us down. Yeah, should make a call out to schools in the North Island to get leavers to go down in a group camp at Orchard and work and enjoy central, central life. Great to see you, Neil. Former Cromwell College um, buddy. It's fantastic. And uh, Michael Ross said, we had the magnificent volunteer army in Christchurch. Why can't we do the same thing to help our food producers? Awesome work team coming through there in the comments. Up next on the show, I have a pre-recorded interview with Minister Damien O'Connor. And this is on a variety of things, but I kicked off by talking to him about his new tree limits. All that up here on Serious Country. This is Sarah's Country. One of the first things you learn when you live out here is where to shop and the things you need to live out here. Like electric fencing. Or horse feed. Or bee suits. Shield bench. Chuck food. Do you want a couple of these? Or something stylish to wear. Not everyone's got stuff like this. But in farmlands we do, and then some. So if you need anything to help your farm... Grow. Milk. Dredge. Rear. Come on in. Because we're out here too. some parts of the country. Prodded by concerns in the rural sector prior to the election, Agricultural Minister Damien O'Connor has moved on his promise uh, after the election that the government will restrict forestry planting over 50 hectares on land use capability classes 1 to 5. If you uh, tuned in last night, you would have heard our interview with Phil Taylor, President of the Forest Owners Association uh, who uh, aired his concerns around this. So now we talk to Minister O'Connor. Welcome to Serious Country this evening, Minister. Uh, how are you? How? What are the impacts around this particular policy on landowners' property rights was one of the big things that came out of the conversation with Phil um, and and permitting the activity of forestry. Uh, what is the one thing that is driving this particular change uh, for you in this next term? Well, that was what farmers were asking for, Sarah. And, uh, you know, there were a lot of people protesting and making a lot of noise about, you know, afforestation taking over, destroying the beef, sheep and beef sector. Um, you know, that was a slight overplay, I guess. But we were mindful of the fact in some areas, um, uh, and, and Wairoa and, and the top of the Wairapa, where we had seen some good farms go into trees. Um, and was concerned about the, uh, I guess, the local jobs and processing of meat in Wairoa. Um, and then, you know, good farmland being lost um, in the top of the Wairapa. So there was this issue of, of uh, the inability of councils to have any say. And so we think it appropriate because it connects back to communities and long-term viability. And of course, it was always going to have some impact on on so-called property rights, that is, you know, what people or who they can sell to and for what reasons. Um, and so the NES that had been put in place by the previous government had just removed some of that ability for councils. And so we believe we're just getting the balance back right. And, and we think that there'll be good, that there are plenty of places to plant trees um, and help farmers to have multiple land use. Um, but we don't want to see, you know, large scale, I, I guess, buyouts. And most of it's by Kiwis or Kiwi companies. And, uh, you know, we want to see a balance in, in the communities that we have in rural New Zealand, the land use uh, being appropriate. Um, and so we've just stepped in to say that there is now an ability or there will be uh, for, for councils to have a say. It may not change final decisions, but at least the opportunity to scrutinise it will be there. Mm. Phil was really honing in on the economics of land use and with the way that the ETS and carbon credits are structured, some may call that a subsidy against other forms of land use and therefore are driving that demand. Uh, there's all these different levers that are going on, when, when do you, is market forces correct and when is government intervention? Well, you know, the ETS, I guess, was set up back in 1999, uh, or sorry, 2008, and then, um, the, you know, the incoming national government endorsed it as the best structure around carbon management, trying to reduce our emissions over time. So the ETS has kind of been locked in there. Um, what they did at that time, of course, is they, they let, the, let the door open for what were cheap and, and uh, credits from Russia and other countries that had no credibility. And so it destroyed the market for carbon. We've shut 
out the door to those foreign credits and and now allowing the market, I guess, around carbon to operate properly. And it's been around $25 a tonne and, and it can go up to $35. Um, and, and people are speculating and, and they may and do lose quite a lot of money if they think it's going to go further up. It may not, as technology actually uh, says in, in, the, in the aircraft industry is a classic one where Air New Zealand was starting to buy a lot of credits, but they don't need them now. And so, you know, maybe the market around um, air travel uh, will collapse for carbon credits and those who may have planted trees hoping to pick up or sell credits at a, at a 50 or $70 market, you know, they may lose money. So, you know, that, that's, that's the market that's operating. Um, I've always preferred, and I think many farmers do, is to have, if you're going to plant trees, you want to calculate your return based on what the timber's worth, you know, and have a, have a sustainable cycle. But carbon farming is a reality um, around, you know, the new, I guess, quest to reduce emissions over time internationally. Um, planting trees is an offset. Um, and so that's another factor at play that probably wasn't there uh, 20 years ago. Mm. Now I want to get to the situation there where New Zealand pork is extremely disappointed with the court ruling on uh, farrowing crates. In 2018 uh, the standards were introduced by yourself after receiving advice from the National Animal Welfare Advisory Committee. Has advice on that welfare uh, practice on our pork farms changed over the last two years? Uh, no it hasn't and, and the uh, NAWAC as, as you've called the Animal Advisory Committee, um, you know, is, a re- is an independent body of astute pe- people who really know about animal welfare, not like myself, um, and they provide advice and have done to ministers. Um, and, and you need a very good reason to, I guess, to challenge and unpick that advice because they usually give it a thorough um, investigation. And so that advice came through to me. A judge has made a ruling, um, look, the industry or others may choose to appeal. So it's not appropriate for me to make a comment on that at the moment. Um, that's still, of course, um, in the legal process. Mm. And, and of course, uh, something to celebrate, there's a couple of things. Uh, let's start with the Biosecurity Awards this, this week. Uh, how are you feeling? Are you feeling extremely proud of the efforts that are going in or are we still a long way off? Well, I mean, it's nice that we have things to celebrate and we got rid of pea weevil, we got rid of fruit fly, or, uh, you know, down the track on M. bovis. Um, there is a lot of things that we can celebrate and did the other night um, because of the hard work of people in biosecurity in New Zealand, um, working for Osprey, you know, working for MPI. There's a lot of stuff happening and there were many community organisations and, and, and volunteers and others um, that, that were acknowledged the other night and that's great. And uh, one of the people there, Linda Peacock, who got the, the Minister's Award is because she's kind of an unsung hero. She's worked behind the scenes, Kiwi Fine Health, um, on the PSA challenge and the fact that we've moved on from that and the industry is, is really thriving um, is a credit to people like her and her in particular really um, and, and so it was nice to, to acknowledge her and Kiwi Vine Health for what they have done um, in the face of you know a, a disease that would have, could have destroyed the industry but indeed we moved on with technology and breeding and, and another um, you know, plant variety So, um, and many other school groups there as well um, and, and yeah, great night. Uh, firstly, congratulations on your portfolio as the Minister of Trade as well, Damien, and uh, certainly something that ties beautifully in with your portfolio of agriculture. I understand from uh, Stephen Jacoby, who we spoke to earlier this week, that the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, uh, you had a lot of work to do with behind the scenes, even before coming into this ministerial position. So how are you feeling about India in particular uh, not being a part of this, and are there some plans to ensure that they will in the future? Um, as we announced when we signed the deal, you know, we, we had a declaration, of course, from all other 15 countries that the door was open to India. Um, we all were disappointed that they weren't there and they'd been working with us in the, in the roughly three years that I was involved, um, you know, come to the meetings, they participated uh, and, you know, and worked through some really thorny issues close to at the conclusion. But in the end, um, Prime Minister Modi decided, you know, um, for political reasons that they should withdraw from that. Um, and that's, that, that's their right to do so. 
but we declared as 15 other nations that we will keep in contact with India, we'll leave the door open and if they want to re-engage down the track, um, which we think would be a great thing, as they expand their export opportunities, particularly in the area of primary industries, they'll be looking for protection and market through the fair rules that we managed to negotiate um, with effectively a third of the world's population. If India had been on board, it would have been a half of the world's population. You know, um, quite a lot of people. Um, over 50% of our exports go into those markets. And what the deal does is offer certainty because the rules are there, they will be upheld. And, and exporters, when you start to develop a product and, and look for markets, then you'll know what the rules will be. Without those rules, you can have an ad hoc intervention at the border or some way through the, the supply chain that simply blocks you. And, and I've spoken to some of the biggest exporters in our country and without those rules, you know, they're totally at the mercy of the people in the market because they've put the effort into making the product, they've shipped it over there, and if someone turns around and says, um, you know, sorry, it's not right, or then there's, there's not much you can do. Mm. So, you know, this is, this is great security, security, um, and that's what we were hoping to achieve. With the way 30% of the world's population is part of um, the, the base of, of this particular partnership, with all of the time and deliberation and, and painful staking uh, negotiations with Brexit and as we slide into the new year and the deadline, I mean, is the UK really going to be a part of our future? Can we pull back and be safe still to grow our exports into other markets or do we still have to focus hard on what was the foundation and cornerstone of New Zealand's uh, economy right back in the early 1900s? Well, you know, obviously this the percentage of products that go to the EU and UK, you know, had diminished over time. And then if you split the markets, um, you know, it's even less. And but but the high value markets, we've got we've got traditions and connections. And, uh, you know, New Zealand lamb in the UK has been well known I, for, for, you know, a century plus. But we, we uh, need to actually, you know, keep those doors open and, and open doors to brand new markets all the time. We can't afford as a trading nation to turn our back on any opportunity. Some of those people are most discerning. They do appreciate the fine quality food. They have to pay a bit more for it because we have to ship it to them. Um, but those are the kinds of opportunities. And there are new opportunities every single day for people with innovative products. And it might be boneless lamb. You know, it was always, um, you know, roasts. And, and we've come up with some great products, you know, lamb racks been pretty hard time because restaurants have closed so you know we the, the meat industry's done a great job to shift its production into products that you know you can sell online that, that are more ready to be um, cooked in home um, and and so you know it, exciting opportunity worth the effort but it will be hard work uh, over the next couple of years talking about high value product um, that's certainly worth it is uh, a couple of themes within Sarah's country tonight minister we have uh, mayor tim cadogan who's just been on the show speaking about cherries rotting on the ground in central otago nikki johnson will be joining us very shortly uh, the same situation happening in the kiwi fruit industry uh, this is an ongoing conversation so my question is actually uh, very light-hearted to you as we talk about celebrating fruit and fruit desserts uh, have you got a sweet tooth for a particular type of fruit uh, that we do so well here in New Zealand I, I do uh, I love desserts and I have to say that boysenberry pavlovas it, it, the, the boysenberry and, and uh, we grew some but it just got that slight tart taste that's offset some of the sugar in the rest of the dessert and so you know it's a perfect combination in my view and uh, I could eat it every night there you go. If you want to get to Mr. The Minister O'Connor's heart, take him some blue, uh, boysenberries with some pavlova. And that's a great way to segue into our last guest here on Sarah's Country. Uh, Chief Executive for the New Zealand Kiwi Fruit Growers, Nikki Johnson, is going to join us out of the Bay of Plenty. And of course, as Minister O'Connor was saying there, his favourite is pavlova. Those damn Australians are trying to pinch not only our pavlova, but also our very valuable workers here from New Zealand. We're going to get Nikki's take on how nervously they are looking at this impending shortage, even though they are one of the last of the season. This is Sarah's Country. Really pleased we got into this. Thanks for your help, Dave. It's a good idea, honey. You reckon it'll come out? Cover it until I'm to leave it 10 minutes. You'll be fine. Good call, Dave. 
Good call on getting those security cameras, Dave. You call a new one yet? Yeah, kind of. When you've got decisions to make, we'll be there to help you make the right call. I'd go for those ones, Bob. Yeah, good call. Did you choose these? Oh, you know. For great advice and insurance, talk to FMG. Fantastic. The comments are flowing in thick and fast. Uh, Kate Taylor, first meal hubby cooked me was an apple pie, but I'd choose a blackberry rhubarb crumble as a fave. Ooh, nice way to win you over, Kate. Michael Ross, old Italian recipe semi-frito. Uh, salted caramel with salted toffee, espresso, hazelnut, chocolate. Oh, oh, oh. Too much goodness going on there. Uh, and Jock, yes, old baked apples uh, take some beating, but this is good. I'm going to try this, Jock. Tamarillos, for those who don't know, tree tomatoes. You put large marshmallows on top, put them in the microwave to melt it together, and then put some ice cream on the side. Interesting. Very nice. And Slats family, sorry, that's how it's come through. What are your thoughts about Australia offering $2,000 for workers to complete six weeks of harvesting? I will put that to uh, who I said was going to be our next guest, but I had a bit of a boo-boo. I think I've got kiwi fruit on the brain and uh, I'm just craving some kiwi fruit right now. Uh, but I did stuff it up and uh, I'm going to our next guest, Susan Goodfellow. The appetite Appetite for plant-based meat substitutes has emerged as more than just a fad with consumer preferences now demanding specific brands and ingredients. A new report by agribusiness banking specialist Rabobank, Rabo Research, my apologies, reveals the growth of plant-based meat substitutes as creating an opportunity for grains, oil seeds and pulse producers here in New Zealand. Now, Rabo Research says that as consumer preferences start demanding these certain brands over others and with them certain ingredients over others, producers of plant-based meat substitutes will increasingly turn their attention towards ingredients sourced to strike the right balance between uh, quality and price. Susan Goodfellow is a founding director of Left Field Innovation and uh, joins us now to further unpack this piece of research. Welcome to the show, Susan. It's great to have you on. Thank you, Sarah. It's great to be here again. Now, the reason I reached out to you is I'm um, sort of you know familiar with the work that you're doing, and I wanted to provide some reality around this. Uh, the opportunity lies in feed field peas, is the headline to Annette Scott's article. Is there first and foremost uh, an understanding of the opportunity here for New Zealand growers? Okay, I think no. To be really blunt, I think that, you know, if you've only got to compare what we produce in New Zealand in terms of field peas, the tonnage, um, which, you know, is quite small, it's around 30,000 tonnes and most of that's dry um, peas for seed and then there's a small, a very small amount for food and feed, animal food. Um, and I think that, you know, and if you compare it to North America, and that's 750,000 tonnes of peas in terms of the capacity for processing those peas into plant plant-based ingredients, so it's fractionating them, you go, well, how can we play in that space effectively? Um, and, you know, ultimately, if we produce the raw material, it's a commodity that will compete with that large-scale supply of commodities. So I think it's really important to understand the context first, understand that there's a significant, there's billions of dollars investment in um, plant-based um, meat alternative startup companies around the world and very little investment, if any, in New Zealand. So from that starting point, where do we go? And I do want to talk about it where the consumer preferences will start to demand certain ingredients over others. Uh, I mean, to date, plant-based meat substitutes are really a commodity. Um, will Do you believe that the demand will get to a point where they'll demand more uh, sort of transparency on the ingredient within these? Yeah, and I think that's the opportunity for New Zealand. It's not just, I mean, we can grow all of those um, plant materials, so the grains, the pulses, the oils, we can grow many of those here and we grow them exceptionally well. What we're missing is the ability to transform those raw materials into, into the food products. So if we can solve that problem with strategic investment and certain processing capability, 
we need to know what it is. So it's got to be market led and how can we create food products with a point of difference? That comes down to the attributes of those raw materials, looking at health attributes, looking at taste and, and functional attributes, and looking at um, how we combine the various um, raw materials to create unique food offerings that consumers care about. And then layering on our provenance with authenticated data to prove where it's come from, how it's grown, that you know the environmental uh, footprint of that product. So wrapping all of that together is a real opportunity for New Zealand. But the first instance is saying, well, we're in the market in terms of the niche can we play because we are a small player and understanding what the consumers want, then coming back here and then breaking that down into identifying what we can create here. But it's a massive, a massive piece of work with significant investment from the market right through to the grower, including in, in new varieties as well, to see how, how can we actually create a point of difference. Do we need to uh, produce added value plant-based proteins here so we absolutely capture the value? Or how is there a way that it may be emerging, I'm, I'm thinking with the blockchain technologies in different ways, that we can actually safeguard the ingredient story all the way through? Because, I mean, I know I take a look and soy is soy to me or almonds almond to me and if I think oh soy bad because I've heard something I'll stay away if it's New Zealand based pea protein versus protein produced in a different farming system in a different part of the world we could be tarnished from that reputation or damage yeah look I think um you know, producing an ingredient is requiring us to transform that raw material. So a lot of people think, well, we can grow peas, so that's the ingredient, but it's not. It's the raw material that we need to then create an ingredient. So plant protein is made up of the protein from the pea, so it's separated out. And that's where I was saying before, we don't have that, that technology here to fractionate or break apart that protein from the pea in New Zealand at scale. So if we are able to, to invest and create that um, infrastructure, then there is potential to, to supply those ingredients. So I think the challenge is going to be, how do you differentiate a commodity ingredient that's actually low value? Because a lot of these plant-based foods are targeting the low value end of the market. So we really need to go, how do we lift that into a category of consumers that are willing to pay a premium for something superior rather than a mass, mass produced, you know, alternate protein meat bun type thing, uh, meat patty type thing. So I think that there, there are opportunities, but it's about creating and capturing that value here in New Zealand. Um, there is a risk if we, if it's a commodity ingredient, it disappears in that uh, value chain and we, we don't capture the value here. As farmers and growers who have traditionally been paid on a weight based selling system um, and, and haven't been able to capture the value of these types of uh, initiatives, going into this particular part, is there, uh, what sort of work is Left Field Innovation doing to provide those value chain sort of infrastructure around um, those who really want to participate in this? Yeah, so there's a, there's a number of things we're doing and I think that around capturing more value um, one key aspect is we've really got to look at different business models that farmers are participating in beyond the farm gate. So they're not just, you know, within the farm gate supplying that commodity and then no more connection. There's got to be a, a closer link with the farmers to the consumer and they've got to move up the value chain and how do we do that? So we're doing some interesting work on various value share business models to ensure that Farmers are participate, have the opportunity to participate beyond the farm gate, but that also requires some investment by the farmer. So obviously there's a risk reward um, consideration there. Um, other work that we're doing is we realise that, you know, this whole transformational piece is, is, a, is a long game. It's not something that can be done in, in a short term. So we've developed a 10-year programme that covers um, land use diversification and obviously, you know, grains and pulses uh, a, a big part of that. Um, it covers providence traceability and new food concepts and being market led in all of those three categories. So it's a significant investment and we're working with, we're still in the process of um, engaging and working through with central government, uh, local government, food companies and farmers. And the farmers that we've 
currently been working with around um, some grains are interested in participating and co-funding this work as well. So they realise this is a long game. It includes bringing in new seed varieties from other parts of the world and trialling them. And it could be four years until we get that, that, that particular variety to a commercial stage um, and be able to produce volume. So it's about playing the long game. There's no quick wins here. No, absolutely not. But what is one that you can share with us that you are excited about that's sort of starting to unfold if there is any? Um, look, I think that you mentioned soy, and it's quite interesting because in some market insight work we did um, about a year ago around what are those near-term opportunities for value. So what is it that we know we can grow that we could get underway reasonably quickly and get it into food companies, uh, you know, so it's the raw material with provenance that could be transformed to some extent into food products with the current processing capability we have in New Zealand. And one of the things that people are screaming out for is um, GE-free soy. And because it's very difficult to, to buy food grade GE-free soy in New Zealand. So we're now looking, working with a plant breeder and have trials underway to identify soy that is fit for purpose here. So it has the cook times, it's the size, it's the color, the mouth feel. And you kind of think, well, Oh, that's an interesting thing that you have to consider, but they're the things that make it fit for purpose for the market. So that's again going to be a wee while away, but it's something that we've got food companies saying, we'll take everything that you can supply. Um, another really interesting opportunity in the last 12 months has been buckwheat into Japan. We have a very uh, exacting client, we're a client with exacting specifications that had visited New Zealand four times um, to make sure that they'd met the farmers, they saw, you know, the areas it was going to be grown in, and they monitored the, the quality all the way through the cycle and have since made these um, high-value uh, buckwheat noodles for uh, customers in Japan and sold out very, very quickly. And so this is it's about understanding the market, and, and it was really working with that customer. We realised the way it had, buckwheat had been grown in New Zealand, we weren't doing it doing it right, <laughs> and it wasn't you know the right moisture content, it wasn't harvested at the right time, to meet the customer's specifications, so that engagement allowed, you know, a second, uh, you know, a reasonable opportunity to come to some farmers in Mid Canterbury, and that's that's um, doubled uh, this year. So, you know, it's it's just working at the coal face, getting in front of the customer, understanding what they want, working with farmers who can tweak what they're doing on farm to make it work, and it's amazing what you can achieve through that engagement, which often farmers are disconnected and they don't get the feedback from the market. And so they're growing it thinking they're doing the right thing and actually it's not fit for purpose. So, so joining this up is really creating some really near term opportunity for value, which is the initial space that we need to operate and to get some runs on the board. Mm. I was actually having a conversation with a, a gentleman from Farmlands at AgFest around this exact topic that farmer mental health would improve if we could ha give them instant feedback uh, from market. Yeah. And it, yeah. I, I strongly believe in that. And there's some cool work going on in that space and in tech yeah. as well. Uh, Susan, thank you so, so much. And it's such great work what yourself and Nick and Pike and the team are doing at Left Field Innovation. But you're not going to get away without sharing with us your favourite fruit-based <laughs> dessert. Well, look, mine's been stolen a couple of times now, so it's the, it's the problem when you come on late in the show, isn't it? You know, that, that fruit crumble. <laughs> but look, I'd have to say probably a, a trifle would, you know, with lots of fruit in it would, would come up, you know, as a nice Christmas treat um, on, on near the top of my list. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Susan Goodfellow there from Leftfield Innovation. And to close the show, we have Nikki Johnson, the Chief Executive for New Zealand Kiwi Fruit Growers, uh, who is going to share with us about their growing concerns of the labour shortage on kiwi fruit. This is Sarah's Country. The recipe for perfect beef and lamb. Take one small fresh country. Make sure it's nice and remote. Now, keep it at the ideal temperature all year round. Next, mix in the farmers. They go perfectly with the nature of this unique place.
add regular sprinkles of rain to really bring out the lush meadow grass. Then let your animals happily graze on this grass all day, every day. And there you have it, New Zealand, the perfect recipe for beef and lamb. Well, he doesn't much know this, but uh, behind his back, we call him the Kiwi Fruit Man. That's Richard Rennie, uh, journalist for Farmers Weekly, who specialises in this particular field and all things kiwi fruit. And covering that in this week's Farmers Weekly uh, is the kiwi fruit industry weighs in on the RSE worker shortage. Kiwi fruit may be the last large crop harvested of the season, and the industry is looking nervously at what the impact is likely to be on other large crops and how an impending shortage of labour can be managed. The Bay of Plenty has expected 2,500 RSE workers over the autumn harvest season, only to receive about half of that, with prospects dim for even this number to be on deck for the coming harvest. We are now joined by Nikki Johnson, Chief Executive for New Zealand Kiwi Fruit Growers Incorporated. Uh, Nikki, can you talk us through what work is going on behind the scenes to try and boost the number of uh, locals available to work in the sector, like we heard from Tim earlier? Absolutely. And uh, I'm sure you and I have talked before, and I'm sure other people have heard us talk before about labour shortages in kiwi fruit. And yep. That's a little bit of a function of, of our growth as we've come out of the PSA and needing to grow quite quickly and needing to find those people to come in. And a little bit of a function of the fact it's a seasonal job, so you're really looking for people for quite short periods of time. So in terms of kiwi fruit, we've been working on what we call our labour attraction strategy, and this is our third year. So um, we're pretty well uh, used to having this conversation and we have a lot of initiatives underway that are aimed primarily at attracting New Zealanders. Um, our workforce is actually primarily New Zealanders, always has been, um, but we will need to attract even more New Zealanders this year to, um, to compensate for some of those workers that we don't have from perhaps backpackers or RSEs. Okay. Uh, the topic of, sorry, the news of the day is the Australians are quite proudly boosting with their chest out, throwing $2,000 to a Kiwi that will jump the ditch to come and harvest. And I listened um, to talk back just prior to, to coming to the show tonight. Uh, they said, we don't really care. It's a free market. We can do what we want. We've got a labour shortage as well. Is this just more on the horizon of um, them flexing their muscles? I don't really think it's a competition, to be honest. I don't think two thousand dollars is um, is really going to cut it to go to land of snakes and um, and uh, spiders um, and work outside in probably searing hot conditions when you can come to the Bay of Plenty and work under the vines where there's nothing that's going to bite you um, and you're going to be close to your family and you can continue to contribute to your life. I don't, two thousand dollars isn't going to cut it. Uh, equally, we're also working with our Ministry for Social Development here in New Zealand about exactly the same thing for New Zealanders and how we can help New Zealanders that are looking for a work to relocate for, for the short period of time that we need those workers. So I'd say watch the space. There's probably some better deals on the horizon. Yeah, well, they were also scanning about their pay rate as well. Um, you probably can't go into those details, but is it is it uh, it's seriously uh, more than just the fact of solving a, a seasonal element to it? it um, or is it the actual attractiveness of the work? Uh, all sorts of things it's a pretty complex conversation to be having actually and mm. something that the industry has been working on quite strongly and there is definitely an opportunity for us to uh, increase the number of permanent roles and the people that are moving into careers in the industry it's a really fast growing industry and so we can um we can really pull people into the industry and give them long-term careers and we've just got to um, be able to attract the right people to pick those up. So it's a conversation about how do we encourage people to come and give it a go and then how do we provide them with, um, with long-term careers. But we will always need uh, a, a number of people to come in for those seasonal peaks. So you've got to work on both of those things at the same time. 
pay rates are important for people, particularly at the moment, but there are a whole lot of other things that are important for people as well. And um, actually, uh, our pay rate survey from the season we've just completed it was pretty positive. Um, it was the average rate's well above living, rate, living wage. So um, I, I think we're, we're managing to address some of those perception issues on multiple levels. Is there a way that you can pair up with the likes of Tim Cardogan in the central Otago district, uh, orchardists down there, whereby uh, the season becomes extended from the the movement of fruit throughout the regions? Yeah, absolutely, when it comes to um, our mobile workforce. So that's in particular our backpackers in our RACs, and we're actually uh, working with the um, specifically with the um, squares in Central Otago at the moment from the Bay of Plenty because as we near the end of this calendar year, sort of getting into mid-December, we go into a slightly quiet patch for, for kiwi fruit as the, as the plants just kind of grow. It's very helpful actually. It gives everybody Christmas off. Um, it's a very useful uh, product when it comes to that. Uh, and so some of our workers will go to Central Otago and they'll... And they'll um, the harvest for those guys in January and February and then they'll come back to us in March so absolutely opportunities to do that but we do understand that asking New Zealanders to have a nomadic lifestyle is not is not right for everyone so the focus is, is absolutely on where we can use our, our, te- our temporary work to, to meet those needs. Mm. Close the show. It's really great to hear some um, some lovely menu. I'm getting very very hungry. I'm I'm not going to lie. As well, our viewers and listeners to all of these gorgeous dessert ideas that are coming through. So you get the last say on what you would have as a beautiful fruit dessert in your family home. Um, well, I just had one, so we'll go with that. <laughs> and I just had some fresh strawberries. So what could be uh, better than strawberries right about now? And, and the strawberry growers need our support. So I'm um, absolutely a big um, supporter of fruit in its natural base. And um, strawberries absolutely right now a big thing. Of course, uh, having worked for both the kiwi fruit and the citrus industries in the past, they're obviously my favourites. But um, for tonight, we, we're definitely going for strawberries. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much, Nikki Johnson, the CEO of the New Zealand Kiwi Fruit Growers and Incorporated there, talking to us um, around, you know, the, the labour shortages. But they've certainly got a fantastic strategy and it has been a conversation, as Nikki said, that we have had and it's sounding like a little bit on repeat. But every time I catch up with Nikki, they are progressing very aggressively and fast on this um, labour strategy and good on them. Uh, that's all we've got time for tonight on Serious Country. I've loved having some awesome comments tonight thank you so much for tuning in on the last show of the week we will be back monday night from seven o'clock live and of course uh, all of the individual interviews are available on demand as well as via video you can head to sarahscountry.com as always the place to get in contact with me as well as sarah at sarahscountry.com and I tell you what, I'm really enjoying the emails coming through. I've had uh, I've had people flicking me articles, fl- um, screenshotting things and sending, Sarah, you need to follow up on this one and this one. Keep going. It's great. I absolutely love it. Uh, so in the meantime, have a wonderful rest of your week. Great weekend ahead, uh, wherever you are around Aotearoa, New Zealand or the world tuning in. Uh, stay safe. And in the meantime, good night and go well. This is Sarah's Country.